Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, uh, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce my uh, colleague, Sasha Racklin. Uh, Sasha or Alexander Racklin, he's a professor uh, of Brain and Cognitive Science and Institute for Data Systems and Society. Uh, we've been thrilled to have him, uh, uh, in, especially in our statistics center, uh, where he's been leading effort in uh, uh, a variety of uh, uh, research activities at the interface of statistics, machine learning, uh, and computer science. And today he's going to uh, talk about, looking at the title, talk about something really exciting, uh, which is in the context of online learning. So Sasha, floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Devarat, and thanks to everyone for the invitation. Uh, pleasure to speak here. Um, so this is going to be based on work um, on, on a number of papers. Um, uh, so the first one is uh, with Misha Belkin and Sash Tsibakov, and then a series of papers with my former student, Tang Yan Liang, and uh, my current student, um, Shi Jai. So um, let me start. Um, I'm going to um, ask the following seemingly uh, silly or, or uh, uh, naive question. Can a learning method be successful if it memorizes the training data? Um, and um, the reason that I'm asking is, is if you uh, take a course in machine learning and maybe even in statistics, um, it's, it's often that we analyze the performance of a machine learning method um, by writing uh, the test error as the train error plus test minus train. Um, of course, this is a tautology, but uh, it is suggestive that um, there is, we, we need to balance um, the, or we, we may try to balance fit to data, which is the first term, and then the expressivity of the model. And, and that's given by this difference between the test and training error. Of course, the bigger the model, the bigger is the second term, the, but the smaller is the, the first term. Um, and so, um, when we go to modern applications, this is from the Zhang et al. 2017 paper, we see that um, in many of the applications of, of deep neural networks, the model is so over parameterized that the training accuracy, that is this first term um, here, training accuracy is, is 100% or the, the error is zero. Um, and the test accuracy is kind of far away from, from that number. So we don't see this type of uniform convergence uh, of empirical and expected quantities that we, um, ex you know, that, that, that we propose in, in, in the classical view of machine learning. So this has been a, 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 an observation that was repeated uh, in a number of papers. And, and um, in the last two, three years, there has been a push to try to understand mechanisms uh, for why um, such a discrepancy can, can, can happen between the train and test accuracy. Um, so um, just a few more results of this sort. Um, this is from 2015 paper by Natia and, and, uh, and, and co-authors. Uh, as you take a neural network and you increase the width of the neural network, so H here is the width, at some point, and, and this is the end of the training, uh, um, epoch or in the end of the training process, I should say. Um, the training error again is zero after you take a model that's large enough and that's, that's easy to see. Um, but what's interesting is that the test error, which is the red and blue, um, does not go up uh, as you would expect from the decomposition that um, I showed on the first slide. Um, and, and, and so th this phenomenon can be reproduced uh, in a number of uh, settings, not all of them, but in a number of settings uh, in, in recent years. Um, I should also say that this is actually an old observation in a certain sense. Um, this is a paper from 1997 by Lawrence et al, uh, where they take uh, a network with uh, 364 times more parameters than training points, which is not too much. It's only 18,000 parameters, but still for, for, for that time, it was shown that as you increase the number of hidden nodes, you, you also have this uh, decrease. And, and I will point out what is different about the you know, 2020 versus uh, 1997. And, and part of it is, is that these are classification uh, losses. And, and uh, uh, the striking part is that the same phenomenon can happen in regression with noisy 
uh, data. So um, when we turn uh, to classical books, um, we do have the statement um, appearing all the time that with too much fitting, the model adapts itself too closely to the training data and will not generalize well. I uh, have the large test error and interpolating fits are unlikely to predict future data well at all. So by interpolation for the rest of the talk, what I mean is that the model uh, after training reproduces the Y values uh, within the training data set. So it memorizes the data. I, I will equate memorization and interpolation, although some people make, uh, make these distinctions. So um, the classical bias variance trade-off is given by this picture. Uh, out of sample on the test sample, you have the red U-shaped curve. On the training sample, the larger model you take, the smaller is the training sample. And, and uh, from this picture, it's suggestive that this point necessarily is to the right of the minimum of the optimal bias variance trade-off. And, and I guess the first point that we'll make is that this has nothing to do necessarily, uh, the, the, the training performance has nothing to do with the test performance necessarily. Um, and then we'll um, get into some more subtle um, um, results, more subtle details. Um, here is another one. You know, uh, you have to trust yellow books. So we go we, we, we go into the yellow books and search for these uh, uh, statements. Um, on the left, you have a, a fit that uh, goes through the data points. It interpolates the data, and um, uh, these authors say that. Uh, this may, may lead to a function that interpolates the data and hence is not a reasonable estimate. So we're not making this up. This is a, a, a uh, something that's ingrained in the uh, in, in the statisticians uh, and, and machine learners uh, 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 kind of training. Um, so let, let me see, let, let me say what is surprising, what is not surprising in, in the, the, the setting of overfitting in deep networks. Um, so what is not surprising is that uh, we have more parameters than sample size. And, and, and you know, th this is just called non-parametric in statistics when you have number of parameters comparable to sample size, um, or, or you can have parameters infinite. Uh, and uh, and per, uh, the number of parameters is in, in, the, eye of the, in the eye of the beholder. It, you know, it, there are different ways to define parameters. Um, Another thing that's not surprising is that good performance with zero classification loss on training data uh, can be obtained. And, and, and there is margin analysis that allows you to trade off uh, the regression fit and, and, and model complexity. And, and in fact, uh, the observation from Adaboost that um, even after perfect fit, that was in the 90s, um, the margins keep increasing. Um, that led to this large margin um, theory, and and um, you know, we can debate whether that is um, has some explain you know power in this particular example, but uh, that's some explanation. Um, uh, another point to make is, is that when the base risk is zero, in other words, when when there is a perfect separator with zero population error, um, that that's also not surprising. So we have perceptron, for instance, one of the first methods, and 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 that perfectly interpolates the data. In, in terms of uh, zero one uh, loss, and, and yet it does well on uh, out of sample. Um, so what is surprising is, is that good performance with zero regression loss uh, on noisy training data can 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 be achieved. Um, this is surprising, and, and somehow uh, the label noise, or the, the 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 noise in the um, outcomes is making its way into the parameters, but it's not hurting the prediction accuracy. So um, uh, we believe that this is a new phenomenon um, that's not restricted to neural networks. And, and so the question that we wanted to ask uh, is what are the general mechanisms um, for, the, for this uh, phenomenon? And, and, and so what I will do next is, is um, show several models where interpolation coexists with generalization in a perfect harmony and, and uh, uh, serves as a kind of explanation perhaps for the mechanisms that can be, um, uh, that, that can be responsible for this phenomenon. Um, and, and, the, and there are a couple of key takeaways that I just want to uh, 
put on the slide before I get into the details. First one is the model simplicity is a subtle, subtle notion, and especially in high dimension. And that's something we will see later. Um, Nonlinear models in high dimension can be nearly linear and yet interpolating. And, and, and so this picture um, uh, of a highly irregular uh, function uh, that passes through the data, that's a very low dimensional picture that we have in our mind. And in high dimensions, things, things can be interpolating and uh, quite, uh, quite, quite nice, close to, close to being linear. Um, another uh, interesting thing that we'll point to is, is a certain implicit regularization um, in kernel methods um, and, and in wide neural networks. And that's due to the algorithm employed for training and also arising from nonlinearities of the kernel uh, function and also the spectral decay of the data. Um, and and uh, um, so the bottom line is that generalization of good, good performance out of sample can coexist with interpolation. So we've uh, been pursuing the following uh, research program where we started with uh, local kernel methods in particular the Nadarai Watson estimator. Um, and I'll describe this very simple result, which is nonetheless um, instructive. Then we um, turn to global methods and we looked at kernel uh, ridgeless regression. And there has been a, 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 another line of work on linear regression um, uh, without kernels that I will mention as well. Um, and uh, there is a connection to neural networks um, through the random feature models and neural tangent models. Um, and, and, and so this line of work um, can explain certain regimes of wide neural networks, why they uh, provably, um, why can, they can be provably optimized and uh, they also interpolate the data and yet they generalize. Um, you know, th th this is not all of the regimes of neural networks, but it, it's at least a, a start. So here's a very incomplete list of references. Um, so this work started with local methods in, uh, with these two papers, Belkin, Sumitra, and uh, Belkin, myself, and Sibakov. Um, then the ridgeless kernel regression was analyzed in these three papers that I mentioned before. Um, uh, the parallel work by in, in the linear regression setting is by uh, Andrea and his group. Uh, and uh, Peter Bartlett, uh, Phil Long, Gabor, I think who is here, um, and Alex Ziegler. And there is a follow-up paper by Bartlett Ziegler um, and, and several other papers. So I, 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 um, um, I will not go into all the uh, details. And so the connection to random features and neural tangent approximation can be seen, and I, and I will mention this at the end, um, and, and one can look at these papers for reference. Okay, so um, let, before I dive into the details, let me just make one technical comment. So the bias variance decomposition that's often studied in machine learning is of the following flavor. Um, I didn't define these notions, but let me just describe the, the, the capital, the, the bold L is, our, is uh, expected risk of a learned function f hat. Um, so this is out of sample uh, error. Um, and when you compare it to the Bayes error, to the best possible over all functions, over all measurable functions, um, we typically split it into the estimation error and approximation error. This has been at the heart of um, machine learning since the work of Vapnik. Um, the reason is that the estimation error can be analyzed using uniform convergence results over this class of functions f. And uh, the rest is an approximation error how well this class F approximates uh, the, the Bayes um, error. So this is a type of a bias variance trade-off, but there exists a, a different bias variance trade-off, uh, bias variance decomposition that's often studied in statistics for square loss in particular. It can be written in the following form. Um, the uh, excess loss, okay, I put expectation here, but it doesn't, doesn't matter too much. Um, the, the excess loss, the loss of the model minus the best possible can be written just as the expected L2 norm with respect to L2P uh, underlying measure. 
Um, and that can be split into two terms. One is um, the variance term and one is the bias term. And so um, we will um, study this type of decomposition rather this type of decomposition because the, the first type of decomposition leads to these questions of uniform convergence, which we don't expect to hold because for the model that we learn, empirical is zero and out of sample is you know 10%. So we don't expect this path uh, to, to actually yield any results. But um, interestingly enough, this path can yield uh, results. And so here in the second decomposition, a trade-off is often parameterized by a tunable parameter of the procedure. Um, and uh, I'll present two flavors of the results. One, one is where one can interpolate the data and that parameter can be tuned still optimally. And then I'll turn to examples where this, uh, there is no parameter um, and still because of some implicit regularization, both of these terms can, can be small. Okay, so uh, first result is um, a, a very simple, um, almost, uh, you know, I, I teach it in half of the class. Uh, um, uh, There's another I Watson estimator. So it's defined as um, in the closed form as sum from one to N, you have N data points. Uh, the data points are XI, YI, uh, YI is a real number. And so we define the function as just a weighted average of the uh, yi's with functions of the following form. Uh, wi of x is um, uh, some kernel k parameterized by h of the difference between x and xi. So you can think of uh, nearest neighbors, but this is a generalization of nearest neighbors. Right? Um, uh, the function k is can be a uh, a box can be a Gaussian kernel, um, and, and this choice has been studied uh, quite quite a bit. So what we have on the left, and I'm just going to sketch first visually what's happening, and then I will go into uh, more detail. Um, what, what's happening on on the left uh, is uh, is a is a Gaussian kernel, and then we vary the choice of h. As you take h, if h is very small. Um, that is not a good choice. It, it interpolates the data, but um, it provides no averaging. Um, what you would like is, 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 is that these functions gather locally, uh, weigh uh, the y variables locally and produce an, a nice smooth uh, uh, solution. And so pr probably in a stat class, I would say that H 0.05 maybe in this case, visually is, is a good um, uh, choice or, or Maybe at zero point one, and then and then you over smooth, right? This is an over smooth solution, probably. Um, now, it, it turns out, and this was noted by in the paper by uh, Devroy et al. Devroy et al. in I think nineteen ninety seven or nineteen ninety nine, that if you take a, a kernel that's singular at zero, then um, this weight becomes um, uh, one at the point in the data set and something else outside, right? So, so the point is that if you take a kernel that's singular, it goes to infinity at zero, then it will always interpolate. And so the solutions that you get are kind of like this. Um, and it has an interesting uh, um, shape. It, it's, it's, it does the averaging because of the tails of the kernel, but it also uh, has these spikes because of the, uh, Singularity at zero, um, and and so what what you get is 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 a uh, is a solution that is smooth plus spikes, and and so we can call it smooth uh, spiky smooth surface if you wish, um, and uh, while for this kernel visual inspection can tell you whether you're under smoothing or over smoothing. It's not possible to, to, to deduce that from just looking at fit to data, right? So, so the values on the data set tell you nothing about whether you over smooth or under smooth. So um, the spiky surface leads to benign uh, overfitting because the effect of the noise is, is localized and, and the bias variance trade-off uh, exists in harmony with interpolation. Um, 
so more precisely the we we can take the following um uh kernel which is just you know one over x to some power uh, where the power is less than dimension over two and truncated at, at one and then uh with this uh kernel uh the result is that for beta holder true function f star we can estimate it at the minimax rate two beta divided by two beta plus d there are some assumptions that i didn't spell out but they're um relatively mild and and and, and the interesting thing is that the f hat is interpolating okay so so the summary is that fit to data is not necessarily doesn't necessarily say anything about overfitting um or or bad out of sample performance and um the data fitting part which is governed by the behavior of the kernel at zero the height at zero is completely decoupled from the bias variance trade-off right so in that in that picture uh uh, uh where you have a u-shaped uh, uh bias variance trade-off and, and then the empirical fit to data the empirical fit here is always zero is always perfect and so you can say okay this is a very silly example because you know you can take any estimator and that's probably what many of you have been thinking you can you can take any good estimator and put delta functions at, at training data and then you don't pay for those delta functions in the l2 population loss because you, you don't get un, unless the the distribution has atoms you don't pay for uh, uh, the behavior of the estimator at the training data right because you get tested on, on points outside of the training data um, and and so you can always construct uh, such an example and that's true and what is interesting is that the uh, in the examples that we'll show next you have much more subtle behavior but still the idea is very similar you have you have a smooth part um, which, which you know learns the phenomenon if you wish and then there is a spiky part which interpolates the data and, and and so this raises the kind of the possibility as a hypothesis that neural networks um somehow also have such a phenomenon that they they also have the, the following behavior that you have a nice part and then spiky part that interpolate the the data um now the spiky part might be important because of computational reasons because we uh to find a, a good model uh, with uh, a, a good fit to data, um, we need to make sure that the landscape, the non-convex landscape for neural nets is, is, is tractable. And that appears to be the case when you over-parameterize. So, so this over-parameterization uh, leads to good optimization uh, and, and produces this these spiky behavior. So that's the hypothesis. Okay, so um, I, I've described the kind of a very simple, um, even silly uh, uh, result for the for the Nadra Watson estimator, and let me now turn to kernel uh, methods, which are more interesting. So um, here I will talk about minimal norm interpolation uh, kernels and neural networks, um, and I will talk about kernels in three regimes. Then I will talk about linear regression, uh, which is due to um, uh, work by other people um, and i'll conclude with um, wide neural networks so, so um, we were motivated by this paper by misha belkin uh, who showed um, uh, back a few years ago that um, neuro, that kernel methods have many of the same uh, phenomenon that um, are attributed to neural networks in terms of generalization despite overfitting and so this paper um, urged uh, uh, the community to, to try to understand kernels uh, before trying to understand uh, deep learning. And um, so I will talk about the two uh, methods, um, which are minimal norm interpolations. The, in the linear case, the minimal norm interpolation in the overparameterized regime, where the number of parameters D is more than the uh, data size N, um, in the linear regime, this is just the best W, uh, so, so the W that fits the data and um, uh, the, has the minimal norm um, in that subspace. Um, in the kernel case, we lift the data into 
in a uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space by mapping axes into features phi of x. And um, we, we choose the minimal RKHS norm solution that interplays the data. And if this RKHS space is infinite dimensional, which is essentially the same as uh, taking infinity here for D, um, uh, it's, it's clear that in, 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 in uh, you, you can always find such a, um, such a solution. Sasha, if I yes. may interrupt, I think yep. uh, David that uh, has a couple of questions in the chat, uh -huh. I, I can read it out for you. Yes, please. Uh, is it possible to empirically see this in neural networks? I think uh, it pertains to the previous slide, if I'm, uh, I'm not wrong. And now it's next question is, is any, any norm here? Um, great, thank you. Uh, these are great questions. So I, I will show some empirical evidence and uh, there, there are papers. Um, um, let me postpone that and, and, and I, will, I will try to answer. In terms of the norm, um, we will consider L2 norm, Euclidean norm here, and this is the RKHS norm. Um, and the reason that we consider L2 uh, uh, and the RKHS is that um, gradient descent on the uh, square loss objective converges to a minimal norm solution. Um, and, and so it's natural to study this, uh, um, this W hat. And um, in the same manner uh, for wide neural networks randomly initialized with a special kind of uh, scale of initialization, gradient descent on those wide neural networks also converges to a minimal norm interpolant where the, the norm is an RKHS norm with respect to a, a neural tangent kernel, NTK. So, so uh, the, these choices of these methods are not uh, ad hoc. They, they, they do come from uh, certain uh, basic considerations. Um, now, in, in terms of the empirical observations, let, let me just postpone that for, for a little bit. Okay, so, um, uh, what is interesting is that um, in the in the case of uh, Nadaraya Watson, that result was optimal for arbitrary dimension. So, in other words, as as long as you take the kernel to be of that form that I presented, and with a power that's below d over two, um, you get uh, for any dimension you get the um, optim minimax optimality. Um, Interestingly, uh, for these methods, um, consistency of these uh, or, or goodness of these uh, procedures um, is really due to high dimensionality. So um, high dimensionality is necessary in linear and kernel regression to generate, to generate a benign spiky surface, which was not the case with a local method. Um, and, and so what I, I will show the, this new phenomenon of implicit regularization because there is no explicit regularization except taking the minimal norm interpolant. Um, okay, so uh, uh, another um, motivation for studying this minimal norm interpolant is, if you haven't seen this, uh, if you do consider kernel reg uh, regression that's the best fit to data in RKHS plus a regularization term. Uh, the conventional wisdom is that you should choose a non-zero regularization. Um, however, uh, it has been observed and we've run this, these experiments ourselves. For certain data sets, if you let lambda go to zero, uh, either arbitrary close to zero or equal to zero, um, you, you only improve performance out of sample. So, so it seems that it, it's not necessary for all the uh, types of data that you, you need to regularize. And so the interpolated solutions are those for which lambda is equal to zero plus, right? So it's a limit uh, from the positive side as you let lambda go to zero. Sasha, another question by mm -hmm. Alka, a sequence of them as I'll ask quickly how yeah. multicollinearity can be solved by ridge regression as high dimensionality causes multicollinearity? Um, so because data are random, um, we can just talk about the subspace spanned by the data. And if the dimension is large enough, uh, 
uh, we, we do interpolate and we choose the minimal norm solution. Uh, uh, so I, I don't think that's a, 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 a necessarily a, a, a difficult distinction. Thank you. So uh, let's see the um, right. So, so so there is still impl uh, simplicity that's enforced by minimal norm interpolant of the data, right? Um, even though we don't regularize it explicitly, among all the solutions that interpolate the data, we take the one that has the minimal norm. So there is certain Occam razor, if you wish, still enforced. So it's not crazy to think that this could work. Um, but the solution can be very spiky in the sense that the norm, RKHS norm of the solution can be large. Okay, and, and I mentioned the other two. So first is 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 the uh, I, I want to substantiate the statement that uh, there there is something interesting about uh, interesting about high dimensionality of the data, um, and 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 what I will present is a lower bound for a particular kernel. Although I don't think there is anything too special about this one, we take the Laplace kernel, and uh, the Laplace kernel will be defined as e to the minus uh, L2 norm of the vectors without the square. So it's not a Gaussian, it's Laplace exponential kernel um, with uh, bandwidth sigma. Um, and the theorem says that in small dimension or in constant dimension, for no matter how you choose sigma, the uh, lower bound is constant. So you do not have consistency as n increases and dimension is kept constant, we do not have consistency of the minimal norm interpolant. And, and, and I guess I, I, I should have made um, more quanti quant put more quantifiers here. The, the result is that with high probability, no matter how you choose the bandwidth, even adaptively given the data, even if you choose this bandwidth based on the data, you still cannot get uh, uh, close to uh, the regression function, right? Um, and, and so the, the interpolation with Laplace kernels doesn't work with constant D. Um, and um, another interesting point is that the Laplace uh, RKHS resulting from this Laplace kernel um, is, is very similar to the NTK, the neural tangent kernel uh, space uh, as shown in these papers, it has very similar eigenvalue uh, behavior and eigenvector behavior. Okay, so, so what's the idea of the lower bound? Well, it's actually very simple to, to draw and will give you uh, uh, some intuition for why, uh, why it fails. So, um, you know, we, we're, we're putting the, uh, the, the, this type of Laplace uh, bumps, right, at data points. And now if sigma is large, so the solution is more smooth, um, the F star is the true function. Uh, we are interpolating the noisy data point, right? Now there is all this volume here that we, we, we are paying for in terms of L2 distance between the F hat and F star. Um, and and, and um, th th this is unavoidable for large sigma. So that, that, that proves kind of visually why, why shows visually why this is a bad idea for, for um, uh, uh, large sigma. Now you can say, well, what happens for small sigma? Well, for very small sigma, these become more like a delta function, right? It drops to, to zero. In fact, um, for any sigma, this is a solution uh, on a real line um, in one dimension, this would be a solution of a rope hanging from these points. And, and the behavior between points is only determined by the heights at the two points, adjacent two points. So here it just hangs down uh, from, from and, and, and goes to zero. And, and so you pay here in terms of L2 distance. And, and so the, the, uh, the point of the proof is to show that these are, uh, these overlap, these regimes overlap. And so you cannot tune the bandwidth to get anything uh, uh, as n goes to uh, infinity. Uh, you do not get consistency. And, and this holds for arbitrary dimension uh, as long as dimension is held constant compared to number of data points. So if 
minimal norm interpolation succeeds, it has to be in the high dimensional regime. Okay, then, then uh, it's natural to study at a high dimensional regime and we'll start with uh, not in the order of uh, uh, kind of historical, how we derived these, uh, we first derived the D proportional to M uh, result, um, but I will first present the kind of the newer result uh, where D is proportional to N to some power, the power is between zero and one. Um, and, and here we find something quite, quite interesting. Um, so the upper bound, okay, this is not a lower bound and it's not exact behavior, but the upper bound on the risk that we find for the minimal norm interpolant, where the risk is defined as the L2 distance between F hat and F star, um, right, the, the excess loss with respect to square loss, um, it has the multiple descent shape. So if we parameterize the, the picture as D is N to the alpha, as I mentioned before, and on the y-axis, we have the rate, uh, how good the result is, the upper bound. So the rate is n to the minus beta. Then we have the following uh, uh, oscillating behavior where we do not get any result at one over the integer power. Uh, and we get good results or the, the, the best results are uh, on the log scale between the, the, the two powers. So um, in, in between these, these powers, right? So uh, there, there are a couple of uh, conclusions. One is uh, the, the minimal norm interpolation in higher dimensional regimes can succeed provably with some rate that goes, goes down to zero um, un unless we are close to these uh, one over the integer powers. Um, and um, you, can, you can say, well, this is an upper bound. And so this is, might not be the real behavior. And I will show that empirically, uh, we do see this uh, uh, type of uh, uh, non-monotonic behavior in the risk as we increase the number of data points. Um, so I will present just a one slide sketch of the result, and then I will pre present a three slide sketch. So what's behind this uh, result? Well, we consider the inner product kernel, uh, K of X, X prime, which is some function of the inner product divided by D. So it's natural to scale the inner product by D um, to make it more like, a, you know, X's are on the sphere, if you wish. Uh, now coordinates of X will be independent and some kind of assumption of that form is necessary because we we know that for low dimensional uh, for low dimension we shouldn't expect the result to hold so we have to it has to be a high dimensional phenomenon so some independence of the coordinates uh, has to be there some form of independence um, now we assume that the function h has this expansion and uh, let's define the empirical kernel matrix as one over n uh, k, uh, this should be little k, k of xi, xj. And the idea um, that will be repeated in several other uh, slides is that we consider the smooth and spiky part. We consider the signal, so to say, and then the spike uh, that allows you to interpolate. So you can think of uh, decomposing this matrix K into two matrices. Now this is a random matrix, random kernel matrix K. And the truncation will be given according to the degree of this function H. But once you decompose it into these two parts, one can show that with high probability, the uh, least eigenvalue of this truncated matrix is at least D to the minus uh, yota. So for if you truncate at degree yota, then uh, all the eigenvalues are lower bounded by d to the minus yota. And also for the for the tail part, um, th this is a much simpler bound that's one over n. Um, and, and so uh, with some work, after you we've established this, you can show that the L2 risk, the closeness of f hat and f star is driven by uh, two terms. One is d to the yota over n, 
and then the other one is n over d to the yota plus one, and that gives that um, that shape that I showed before. Right, you have good performance at when n is exactly at d to the you know yota plus one half, um, and there's there's some kind of implicit regularization between these integer powers because we didn't do any explicit regularization. Right, we we, we didn't. Uh, uh, regularize the problem, we just uh, fit the data and took the minimal norm solution. Okay, so let me go into some more details on this. I guess I have maybe 10, 15 minutes. So um, just uh, briefly, um, what, what are we gonna do? So we're gonna write out the kernel matrix, each entry of the kernel matrix. We'll just plug in the uh, uh, that expansion of the function age and uh, let's just expand it out. You, you get a bunch of uh, uh, monomials uh, with um, coefficients and um, uh, R is the multi-index here. And, and the norm of R is just the sum of the, uh, of, of the Rs, right? So um, the, this can be written in, uh, okay, so, so now, now we can truncate this expansion and consider the truncated kernel. Uh, it's the same expansion, except we go to just the yota for the for the degree. And, and um, we can always write this kernel as a, a product of features. And so this also has, the, the truncated kernel has a product of feature representations, phi, phi transpose. So you can think of, the data from the uh, you know the original data matrix X as being transformed into these polynomial features, uh, where the features are now in the dimension uh, d choose i roughly, right? D choose i or d to the i if you wish to uh, uh, round up. So d to the i features um, uh, and. Um, um, uh, to get a lower bound on that eigenvalue of the minimal eigenvalue of that kernel matrix, we would have to study uh, this random uh, feature matrix, uh, random kernel matrix. So here's the theorem. Um, it, it says that um, uh, under some weak assumptions, um, we don't even need sub Gaussianity. We just need for each coordinate to have some uh, polynomial decaying tails. Um, with hyperability, the uh, kernel matrix truncated at the iota has, as I mentioned, d choose i non-zero eigenvalues. And all of them are larger than d to the minus iota. And the range of this empirical kernel matrix is uh, the, the range of the, the span of the uh, of, of, of these polynomial, multivariate polynomials with degree bounded by iota. So the, the, this, this theorem gives you a uh, a this what Andrea Montanari calls a staircase phenomenon. So you have increasing lengths of eigenvalues, um, uh, which are smaller and smaller. Right. So so there is a step of d to the iota eigenvalues. Each one of them is d to the minus iota, and then the next one is uh, uh, smaller, but there are more of them, and so forth. Right? So th this gives the structure of the uh, eigenvalues of that random kernel matrix. And um, let's see, maybe I should skip this quickly. Um, uh, so th these features are hard to analyze because of correlations. As you can see that just from the definition, there are lots of correlations. Uh, uh, what we do is we do Grant-Schmidt orthogonalization process uh, to change the basis. Once we change the basis, we consider it new features, psi, and these features are weakly dependent. So we, we, we can show that these features are more tractable. And, and so with this feature representation, um, uh, it's, it's easier to show a, a, a lower bound on the smallest eigenvalue. And this process, importantly, that this process, the grant schmidt process, uh, has a bounded operator uh, uh, norm. And, and so you don't disturb the eigenvalues in this grant schmidt process. So this is a genetic procedure for uh, uh, changing the, 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 the basis and, and looking at better features uh, for our problem. So we don't have to consider a specific Gaussian uh, random variables and, and, and uh, do the usual Hermit polynomials and stuff like that. Um, so um, the result uses the 
kind of the techniques from small ball uh, method, which were uh, uh, pioneered by Kolchinsky and uh, Mendelssohn. Um, so if you can establish a comparison of the fourth moment and the second square of the second moment, then uh, we can establish uh, um, uh, a low, essentially a lower bound on eigenvalues using, using the techniques similar to Kolchinsky and uh, Mendelssohn. Okay, so let me let me go forth forward. So the the the, the bottom line is that uh, I'm just informally stating this: the, the variance of the estimator is bounded by this d to the i over n plus n over d to the or iota plus one, I should say. Um, and under suitable assumptions on f star, the bias is also dominated by the variance. And so you have the bias variance decomposition where both terms are dominated by 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 this expression that gives that upper bound. Okay, so that, that's a very quick uh, uh, summary of the techniques. And um, please look at the paper for the details. Now you can say, all right, the, these are upper bounds. They have they might have nothing to do with uh, em, em, empirics. And, and so interestingly, we do find this empirical evidence of multiple descent as we de increase, sorry, sorry, the, the axes are not labeled, but here we, we increase the number of data points uh, and we see that the indeed at predicted vertical integer powers or one of the integer powers, um, we get a, a spike up, maybe not as high as the prediction, but uh, the places are correctly predicted where the spike should occur. And um, um, okay, we, we don't have a, at the moment the lower bound that shows that we ha should have these spikes that seems to require some an interesting uh, random matrix theory that uh, uh, maybe someone can can do, um, uh, but yes. So so since since uh, this work, uh, uh, there have been papers, some of them from uh, Harvard, showing that in neural networks you have the same non-monotonicity phenomenon that you as you increase the number of data points, the out of sample performance has these uh, alternating uh, uh, up and downs in terms of behavior. And, and this is very counterintuitive because you think that the more data you have, the, the better uh, the result should be, but it's not the case for these uh, um, minimal norm interpolants because uh, the conditioning of the matrix uh, changes uh, with, with the number of data points. Essentially the, the idea is, is I can briefly describe the idea. Uh, the as you uh, when when n is equal to d to the iota exactly, um, you have you can um, it's it's, it's it, the, the same situation as if you had a, a linear regression with the number of parameters equal to the number of data points. So here the number of parameters is d to the iota, where iota is the degree of the polynomial. Right, the d is the dimension of the data, and, and so you cannot do anything, right? And if, if d is equal to, uh, uh, if, you know, if p is equal to n in the statistical sense, uh, uh, you, you you're in trouble. But then, as you start getting more and more data, you're able to sketch those first d to the iota directions better and better, right? And just as the classical statistics would say. You know, you 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 get more n, larger n, for the for the for the same uh, directions, but then you also at some point start to to get new directions in the in the data given by the degree yota plus one of the uh, of the polynomials, but you don't you cannot reliably sketch those directions, you cannot reliably estimate those directions, and so you start paying for that in in, in variance, and 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 so, and so that leads to the spike up. And uh, un until you pass that spike and you have enough data to estimate all those d to the yoda plus one and, and so forth, right? So, so there is some intuitive, uh, intuition for why this should be the case. Okay, so um, the, this is the multiple descent picture. What I described um, so far is the alpha equals to zero is this point where you cannot do anything, uh, at least if you, Right, if you keep d constant and let n to in, be infinity, for the Laplace kernel, you cannot do much. Um, and then I described this uh, upper bound of this shape, uh, 
and um, uh, um, I was going to, planning to also describe the d equal to n, where there is some interesting implicit regularization. So let's see if I can do it in maybe in, in one minute. D proportional to n regime. So the idea here is um, is the following: in in this n equal to d regime. Um, this is the closed form solution for the for the minimal norm interpolant. Uh, it, it's the k, uh, I know the, the x. This is a vector of x with every element of the data set, and this is the kernel matrix inverse, and then this is the vector of y's. And um, uh, what we noticed in 2018 is, is that if one uses a random matrix theory um, developed initially by uh, El Karawi at, at Berkeley, then um, under mild conditions, the behavior of this kernel matrix is similar to linear plus ridge. Um, and and it's, high, it's, it's, it's a high dimensional phenomenon when n is proportional to d. And so if you replace this kernel matrix by, by, by this one, you can see that there is certain similarity to implicit regularization driven by, by, by this curvature of the kernel uh, function. And, and, and so one can define effective dimension. Um, but let me actually not present these results because I, um, Andrea Montanari and co-authors have stronger results now um, that, that um, are uh, on archive. Um, uh, this is Hasty et al. paper. Um, and, and so let, let me just um, say that there is some interesting implicit regularization happening due to cur the curvature of the kernel and, and decay of the eigenvalues. Um, let me briefly mention uh, a, a very interesting line of work in, on linear regression uh, by uh, uh, Peter Bartet, Phil Long, and Gabor Lugosi, Alex Ziegler. Um, and, and so this is a linear inter, uh, minimal norm interpolant in D greater than N regime. And so you can say, okay, this already subsumes um, the kernel case because well, D, you, know, you can take D uh, to be that, that, that effective dimension or, or that, that dimension of the kernel space. Um, what is different is that here, uh, these papers assume sub-Gaussianity or independence of the coordinates. And that doesn't hold um, for the kernels because the, the, the kernels multiply these uh, coordinates together. And, 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 and so the, just the assumptions of this do not immediately uh, translate into the assumptions um, um, in the current case. Um, so just very briefly, uh, we have a very similar phenomenon. You can take the uh, data matrix and let's just assume for simplicity that um, the covariance matrix is, is a diagonal, that the, the population is a diagonal. And uh, you can split it into the signal part, the smooth part, and the spiky part, and I'm I'm calling it spiky, even though of course these are just you know, uh, uh, of course this is just linear, but uh, it does have the same uh, um, intuition that the tail part, the tail of the uh, of the data, in certain regime can act as scale of identity, and this is given by this lemma appearing in in in, in Bartlett, Long, Lugos, Ziegler that the, all the eigenvalues are sandwiched between sum of the tail eigenvalues minus lambda k plus one times n uh, below and above up to constants. And so if you choose k such that uh, the sum of the tail eigenvalues is larger than n times the kth eigenvalue or k plus one eigenvalue, if there exists such a k, then both sides are sandwiched and you do have this gamma, which is a uh, uh, implicit, provides implicit regularization and it's the sum of, sum of the tail eigenvalues. So you, if you have features that decay, uh, that the eigenvalues in the population decay at a certain uh, rate, um, not too fast and not too slow, then you can expect uh, um, um, this implicit regularization to appear. Um, and uh, I'm happy to answer a question. So let's see, how, how much time do I, should, should I, I should wrap up probably. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. And um, 
there's one, there are two questions from Dev that they are waiting and I thought I didn't, didn't want to interrupt. So uh, mm -hmm. maybe you can take at the end. That's, that sounds, sounds good. Yeah. So let me just say that um, uh, just one last minute is that the, how is this connected to neural networks? Well, so take for simplicity one layer neural network, um, uh, one hidden layer in neural network, then um, if you randomly initialize and keep uh, uh, randomly initialize these directions W, this is a random feature model where you only optimize over the coefficients of this top layer. Um, and this is the neural tangent model where um, you can you, you work with the gradient of the, um, uh, the the gradient of the features are provided by the gradients. And, and so one can relate um, an, an optimization path in neural networks to these two classes. And, and that gives rise to uh, this kernel, which is called, called the neural tangent kernel. Okay, so that, that's all I want to say. Um, um, the bottom line is interpolation can coexist with generalization. Uh, we found uh, several interesting uh, uh, new implicit regularization methods that, that seem to uh, guarantee um, good out of sample performance despite interpolation. And I guess just model complexity is a subtle notion. So, you know, you can, you can, uh, uh, you know, I was always unsatisfied when I was learning uh, uh, machine learning and statistics where the, that the, uh, some Occ Occam razor was, was postulated as taking the simplest model, but then it was always in terms of regularization. And, and here you can see that simplicity can be enforced even though you go through the data points. Thank you. Thanks, Sasha. Uh, so there are three questions I have. Um, so I'm gonna read them one by one uh, and then maybe sort of, and there's one more uh, or maybe, yeah. Okay, so let me sort of st start before it starts the getting longer here. So uh, Dave, this question is conventional wisdom is that there are no spikes for neural networks. The loss goes smoothly down with increasing data. And another question from Dave that is that even for the simple one layer wide neural network used in tangent kernel papers, do we have the spiky behavior? Right, so uh, uh, the first question was, was I understand the, the observation that empirically as you increase uh, the number of data points, you have uh, a steady decrease. Um, so uh, possibly I, I, I haven't done those experiments, but there are papers uh, that suggest otherwise, at least in certain regimes. So I should say that these results are very particular. Uh, it, it could very well be the case that under some mild additional assumptions, these bumps disappear. So um, it's very well possible that we don't, in many situations, we wouldn't see those bumps. Um, and what was the second question is the, for NTK, whether we have the spikes. So the NTK um, is a particular kernel. It's an inner product kernel, except it also depends on the norm of the, uh, of X and X prime. And for that kernel, uh, the same result holds in terms of the multiple descent, at least under the assumptions that we have. And so at least in theory, um, okay, th these are upper bounds, so we don't know um, whether they are truly there, but I do, I do believe that some kind of non-monotonicity is expected. I should also say that um, the result by, uh, results by Peter Bartlett and Gabor Lugosi, um, you can engineer any type of landscape for the bias variance. Um, <laughs> You, you, you can end, it, it can have arbitrary, uh, you know, uh, almost arbitrary behavior um, if you let me design the population distribution. Whether that is true in distributions that we encounter in practice, I don't know. Okay. And uh, maybe one last question uh, by Manjunath. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk. Is there a similar theory for recurrent neural networks? Um, is there a similar theory? Uh, so um, uh, if I understand correctly, 
the question was about this. So th this slide, I went very quickly, but there is a, at least in uh, wide neural networks, and this can be multiple layer fully connected neural networks, um, there are results that show that for, if you take width large enough um, compared to uh, the number of data points um, and randomly initialize and you start the gradient descent or, or gradient flow, um, then you converge to a minimal norm interpolant solution with respect to this and uh, neural tangent kernel. So all the, the, all the results that I've mentioned before about kernels apply to these models. Right, well, uh, Sasha, thank you. And thank you everyone. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, I know this is the, uh, Sandeep, what would you suggest in terms of the next thing? Uh, so you mean tomorrow? Uh, yeah, is, is there any announcement we need to make here no, or? It's a small announcement that we'll be starting an hour later tomorrow. So we start at 6.30 in the evening. We have a couple of talks and then we break for dinner and then we have a late night talk tomorrow. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. See you, everyone. Thank you, Sasha. Bye.